Hi, this is Pastor Greg. Welcome to our worship service for April 26th. We're glad to have you join us today. In just a moment, Alec will be leading us in a time of worship, and I just want to encourage you where you're at to lift your voices to the Lord and join us as we sing our praises to God. Good morning, church. Thank you so much for joining us today. Would you sing Amazing Grace this morning? How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. It was grace that taught.
darkness seems to hide his face I rest on his unchanging grace In every high and stormy gale My anchor holds with me shall come with trumpet sound Oh may I then in him be found Dressed in his righteousness alone Faultless stand before the throne Thank you, Alec, for leading us in that time of worship. Well, last week, as you'll recall, we began a three-week series called Comfort for Curious Times. Obviously, these are very curious times that we're living through right now, and so I just wanted to take some time to address how we can have our faith fortified and deal with anxiety and uh, those kinds of things as we think about what it means to live for the Lord during times that are uh, unprecedented. Last week, we began our first message by talking about the importance of facing down fear. Our text for last week's message was 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, which tells us that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. 
And as we looked closely at that verse, we came away with three keys for facing down fear. We are to be courageous, to be compassionate, and to be in control. Well, today as we continue our series, we're going to be looking at the subject, Fortifying Your Faith. And I believe it's a very important message because the Bible tells us that faith is the victory that overcomes the world. With that in mind, let me invite you to join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we turn our attention to your word and we consider the important subject of faith today, we pray that you would give us eyes and ears that are open and a heart that is receptive to what your spirit would speak to us. Help us to understand it and to know how to apply these truths as we live during these curious times. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. In Acts chapter 27, there's a rather inspiring story about the Apostle Paul. He was traveling by ship with some people when a prevailing wind bore down on them. And for several days, they were caught in a very violent storm. And the Bible says that at one point the storm was so great that they were actually jettisoning the ship's tackle and the cargo in order to stay afloat. Before it was all over, they were hungry, they were helpless, they were hopeless. And it was in the midst of that situation that the Apostle Paul stood among them and said, I urge you to take heart for there will be no loss of life among you but only of the ship. He then told them that an angel had appeared to him with a message of hope. And so he said, Take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. What an amazing event. I mean, here's Paul on a ship in the middle of a violent storm, and yet we find him not hunkered down in a corner but standing among the people, giving a pep talk to the ship's crew, telling them, take heart, be encouraged. Well, what was the reason for Paul's confidence? I mean, how was it that he was able to be so calm and so collected? Well, the answer is found in his own words. He said, I have faith in God. Wow, what a powerful picture of what faith can do. In Matthew chapter 17, Jesus said, If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. You see, when all hope seems lost, faith in God can pull you through. Faith in God can make all the difference in the world. With that in mind today, I want to give you three keys to fortify your faith. A healthy and robust faith is not a matter of chance. If we are to enjoy a faith that is sturdy, a faith that is effective, a faith that will see you through those storms of life, then you really need to take steps to fortify it. As we'll see, faith is fortified when we feed it, when we guard it, and when we exercise it. So the first key then to fortifying your faith is feed your faith. In Romans chapter 12, verse 3, we're told, Think with sober judgment according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. So we can see here that each Christian has been given a measure of faith. Some have great faith. Some have faith that is small. But whether large or small, faith is a gift. God has assigned the gift of faith, as it were, to each person. A measure of faith, if you will. Now, I know that when I was a little kid, um, there wasn't much that I didn't eat. I wasn't like one of these kids that was really finicky. In fact, anything my mom put in front of me, I would eat and, and enjoy. But can you imagine how difficult it would be to grow strong and to grow up if I wouldn't have been so fond of food? I wonder how many times our spiritual growth lags behind because we don't properly nurture and care for our faith. Feeding it 
as we should. So what are you going to do with your measure of faith? Are you going to neglect it or nurture it? Will you support your faith or will you ignore your faith? The answer is really up to you. Throughout the scriptures, we're taught the importance of making the most of every spiritual opportunity that we've been given. In Psalm 69 and 13, David says, My prayer is in an acceptable time. Isaiah the prophet said, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Then the writer of Hebrews says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. The point is, there is a opportunity that is given that we need to take advantage of. In fact, Jesus told his disciples to make, make sure that they take advantage of every spiritual opportunity. In John chapter 12, he said, You are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light, before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Believe in the light while you have the light, so that you may become children of light. And so it's clear in the scriptures we are to take advantage of every spiritual opportunity we've been given. The great Quaker poet John Greenleaf Whittier put it like this, Of all sad words of tongue or pen, the saddest are these, it might have been. Of course, the theme of lost opportunity is something that Jesus really drives home when he tells the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25. You'll recall he tells this story of a rich man who was going on a journey. But before he left on the journey, he called his servants together and he entrusted his property to them. To one he gave five talents, to another he gave two, and to a third he gave one each according to his ability, with the expectation that they would do something with the talents. Well, the one with the five traded them and made five more. The one with two made two more, but the one who had been given one talent buried it. He didn't do anything with it. Well, the Bible says that when the master returned, he settled accounts with his servants. The ones who had invested were blessed and rewarded. But the one who did nothing with his opportunity was rebuked and judged. So clearly, God expects us to take full advantage of the spiritual opportunities that he gives to us. When it comes to fortifying our faith, God expects us to take an active role. We're to nourish ourselves. We are to encourage ourselves in the Lord. We're to feed on the holy word of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, Moses declared, Man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Now, if that passage sounds familiar, it should. You'll recall that Jesus quoted these words of Moses when he was being tempted of Satan in the wilderness. So clearly, feeding on the word of God is an essential component of, of a fortified faith. Psalm 119 celebrates the great value of the Word of God. There we're told the Word of God teaches us to distinguish between right and wrong. The Word of God leads us to the truth. The Word of God opens the eyes of our understanding and points the way to wisdom. The Word of God revives us and restores us. The Word of God leads us to happiness and peace and joy. It reveals God's character and tells us of God's promises. The Word of God strengthens us. It protects us. The Word of God is an eternal and unchanging, solid and reliable foundation for life. In verse 89, David says, Forever, O Lord, your Word is firmly fixed in the heavens. You see, the Word of God teaches us the truth about life, about eternity, and even about the rebellious nature of our hearts. One Bible scholar puts it like this, the Bible will diagnose our problems with a clarity that is sharper than any surgeon's knife. Well, each one of us has been given a measure of faith, and that faith grows as we nurture it 
feeding on the Word of God. Romans 10, 17 tells us, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Now, we all have faith in something. Even people without religion have faith. What our faith is in depends on who or what we are listening to. If we listen to the world, well, then we'll have faith in the world systems. And we'll allow the world to dictate how we think and how we feel. We'll allow the world to tell us what's important. We'll allow the world to determine our values and priorities. On the other hand, if we feed on the Word of God, we will operate in an entirely different realm. We'll see the world and we'll see life as God sees them. And we will think and feel and even behave in ways that reflect our faith In God. Yes, each one of us has indeed been given a measure of faith. And that faith grows as we nurture it, feeding on the Word of God. But it also grows as we pray in response to asking God to increase our faith. Back in Mark chapter 9, we're told the story of when a man with an epileptic son came to Jesus. And he said to the Lord, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus looked at the man and said, if you can, all things are possible for the one who believes. And the man responded, I believe, help my unbelief. What a beautiful prayer. What a sincere prayer. What what an authentic request for help. He didn't try to fool the Lord. He was just honest. I believe. Help my unbelief, he said. Well, the apostles had a similar request. The Bible says that they asked Jesus one day, Lord, increase our faith. You see, each one of us has been given a measure of faith. So what are we going to do with it? That faith will grow as we nurture it on the Word of God and in response to our prayer, Lord, increase our faith. And it's the first key to fortifying your faith. Feed it. Feed your faith. Well, the second key to fortifying your faith is to guard your faith. Not only should you feed it, but you should also guard it. It's extremely important because according to the Bible, We are living in a perpetual state of spiritual warfare. It's true. And we are not wrestling against flesh and blood. Rather, we are wrestling against spiritual powers of darkness in high places. It's what we're told in Ephesians chapter 6. Well, listen, since we are engaged in a spiritual battle... The weapons that we use must be spiritual as well. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. He says, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Now frequently, Satan will try and distract us from the real battlefield. He tries to divert our attention away from the spiritual nature of our fight. And he succeeds in that endeavor when we take offense at a fellow brother or sister in Christ. He succeeds when we betray each other. He succeeds when we gossip, when we backbite, when we accuse one another. But friends, we've got to remember that the battle we're fighting is a spiritual battle. It's not against flesh and blood. It must be fought then with spiritual weapons. As Paul describes the battle that we are in, he says, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. The shield of faith. It is one of the most important defensive weapons that we possess Peter tells us to be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, 
knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And then in his first epistle, the Apostle John tells us, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. You see, it's by using the shield of faith that we are able to quench the fiery darts of the enemy. According to the Bible, Satan continually shoots fiery darts at us. He shoots us with fiery darts of doubt. He seeks to get us to doubt the word of God. Remember how he tempted Eve? He said to her, Has God said... And of course, he says the same kinds of things to us today when he says, is the Bible really the Word of God? Can you really trust that the Bible is true? Unfortunately, many have been destroyed by the fiery dart of doubt. Satan also seeks to get us to doubt our salvation. The Bible says that God's divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He has granted to us His precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. And yet Satan tries to get Christians to doubt their salvation. Over the years, many people have shared with me that they are tormented by such doubts, doubts regarding their own salvation. But friends, God doesn't want us to live in such turmoil. This is why we're told in 1 John 5, 13, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. By the shield of faith, we quench the darts of doubt. We must take up that shield by choosing to believe the Word of God rather than the lies of Satan. Satan attacks the deity of Christ. Satan attacks the gospel message that Jesus is the only way to God. Satan attacks the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And of course, there are fiery darts of temptation. Think about how Moses was tempted by the treasures of Egypt and the glory of the throne. But the Bible tells us, By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Or consider Joseph when he was tempted by the wife of Potiphar when she tried to seduce him. And what did he say? How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? We're all engaged in an ongoing spiritual battle. And in that battle, our great defense is the shield of faith. We guard our faith as we choose to believe the word of God rather than the lies of the enemy. So three keys to fortifying your faith. Number one, feed your faith. Number two, guard your faith. And then number three, exercise your faith. Well, as we've seen, God gives every believer a measure of faith. We don't all receive the gift of faith as a spiritual gift, but we do all receive a measure of faith. And how we use that faith is really up to us. For faith to remain strong, it must be exercised. In Romans chapter 4, Paul points us to the faith of Abraham. And we find there that God had given Abraham a promise that he would have a son and through that son all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And God gave that promise to Abraham when he was an old man, well advanced in years. And then for a long, long time, years actually, Abraham waited for God to fulfill that promise. But the Bible tells us that over those years of waiting, Abraham's faith did not falter. It did not waver. When God gave Abraham the promise, 
Abraham simply believed God. We're told Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So how did God, uh, how did Abraham believe God? What did he do? Well, he looked to God, first of all. He didn't weaken in faith when he considered his own body, the Bible says. So it had to do with what his focus was upon. Uh, it would have been very easy for Abraham to look at his own body and say, how in the world is this going to happen? I'm an old man. And look at my wife. She's beyond childbearing years. But Abraham's focus was not on himself. His focus was on God and the promise that God had made. He knew that God was able to make them fruitful regardless of their age. So he looked to God. And the Bible tells us that he glorified God. His faith was strengthened as he gave glory to God. In other words, Abraham believed the promise that God had made and he thanked God for the promise, giving him the glory, knowing that God was fully capable of bringing the promise to pass. Abraham then did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. Well, the Bible tells us the story of a man who did waver in his belief. In 2 Kings chapter 6, we're told that the king of Syria was warring with Israel, but the king wasn't having much luck. You see, the prophet Elisha was receiving special revelation from God that was telling Elisha about the plans that the king of Syria was making how he was going to attack, what his strategy was going to be, even the details of his troop movements. Well, when the king of Syria learned of this, he said, find out where Elisha is that I may send and seize him. And so the spies went out and pretty soon the report came back to the king of Syria that Elisha was to be found in the city of Dothan. And so the Bible tells us that the king of Syria set horses and chariots and a great army. And they came by night and they surrounded the city. Well, in the morning, Elisha's servant rose early and went out and saw the great army surrounding the city. And he staggered in unbelief and fear fell upon him. And he went back to Elisha and he reported to him saying, what shall we do? And Elisha said, don't be afraid. Those who are with us are more than those who are against us. And then he prayed, Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. And the Bible says that God opened the spiritual eyes of Elisha's servant. And he saw the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. It's amazing what you can see when you look through the eyes of faith. Jesus said, with God, all things are possible. In fact, with God, nothing is impossible. So today, let me encourage you during these curious times to remember, we are in a spiritual warfare. A warfare not against flesh and blood, but against the spirit forces of evil. The only way we will ever be able to stand is in the armor of God. As we clothe ourselves in the armor of God, we're able to stand against the fiery darts of the enemy. We rise in victory over Satan and we watch as the power of God puts to flight the powers of darkness. Remember, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. So let me encourage you, be proactive. Take every opportunity to fortify your faith by feeding it, by guarding it, and by exercising it. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you today that you have given us the victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and that we will overcome Satan by the word of our testimony and by the blood of the Lamb. Help us, Lord, today to take seriously this call to fortify our faith by feeding on the Word of God, by praying, Lord, increase our faith, by guarding the faith that you have given us, 
and by exercising the faith that is ours. And Lord, as we do that, I pray that you'll help us to remember the context for all of this is the spiritual warfare that we find ourselves in. Help us then not to rely upon our own strength, but rather to recognize the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not of the flesh, but are mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. And now, Lord, as we prepare our hearts to give back to you a portion of that which you've blessed us with, we ask that you would take these tithes and offerings, that you would multiply them, and give us wisdom to know how best to invest them in your kingdom work. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, I just want to remind you that you are able to give your financial contributions by mailing them to First Baptist Church at 723 St. Louis Road, Collinsville, Illinois, 62234, or by visiting us on our website at www.fbcollinsville.org. Once you're there, you can scroll down to the bottom of the screen and click on the green Give button. Thank you as you continue to honor the Lord through your financial contributions.
And now I want to send you forth with the blessing from God's word. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord be gracious unto you and give you his peace now and forevermore. Amen.